Hello, true duelists. It's YGO Strat's Yu-Gi-Oh! Single Card History, where I'm going to be talking about some of the cards that have impacted Yu-Gi-Oh! throughout the years, and some of the other ones that didn't. Today's card, one of the weirdest effects to have on a trap card of all things, Ultimate Offering. Ultimate Offering was first released in 2002, and the starter decks Yugi and Kaiba appearing in both decks as a peasant rare. And funny enough, despite a number of reprints, it's never gotten a higher rarity than Super. The Super rare print would of course come in Champion Pack Game 4, a pack so rare that just look at the resolution. Got as many pixels in that picture as this video does minutes. Also got a Dual Terminal Parallel Rare in 2010 from Dual Terminal 3, which is arguably a higher rarity than Super, but one of these cards sells for 6 and the other sells for 100, so you tell me. Last thing I'll mention is it does have a rare print that it got in the Duelist League 13 Participation Card Series in 2011. Super relevant, I know. For time on the ban list, it's been around. The card was first limited on the September 2006 ban list, going from unlimited right to limited, where it would stay for about three years before being semi-limited on the March 2009 ban list, and then back up to three and unlimited on the March 2011 ban list two years later. A year later, Konami rolled it back down to semi-limited on the March 2012 ban list, and then six months after that, they limited it in the September 2012 ban list. Its fate would ultimately be met on the oh to spicy September 2013 ban list, where as I make this video, it has stayed ever since. Continuous trap card, its effect reads, During your main phase or your opponent's battle phase, you can pay 500 life points immediately after this effect resolves, normal summon, or set one monster. Ultimate Offering is a funny card, because it being a trap very much hinders its usability, but the effect is so absurdly strong that were you to put it on a spell card, it would be banned instantly, more or less, even in 2002. Imagine if every deck normal summoned as often as Flu does on turn one. My god, what a nightmare. <laughs> Still, a trap card from 2002 that doesn't interact with the opponent is just funny to think about. Ultimate Offering for me has always been a part of two decks precisely, based entirely on one specific night in early 2013, where two of my friends spent the entire night dueling Gadget versus Medulce, both playing this card, and whoever saw it first winning outright in like 99%. I don't think that was ever not the case. Which is fitting, because looking at the card's usage historically, there are two decks that used it best, with one other fishy deck choice that we'll get to later. Starting as early as 2007, with the release of the Gadget Monsters, people started to tech the card in to Gadget decks. It's not hard to see why. Each Gadget will search another one on Normal Summon, meaning you can cycle the engine of every Gadget in your deck to not only help you increase the odds of drawing your other more powerful cards in your deck, but also launching an onslaught of little dudes to beat down the opponent with. They won't win in battle, but if there's five of them, they can certainly get the beat down on the opponent's life points. And this only got better with the addition of easy access to Synchro Monster, and especially with the release of the Machina Monsters and most of all, Machina Gearframe. The gadgets being level 4 could give players access to some solid Synchro plays, even if the deck more often than not needed something like Mind Control to yoink a level 2 or 3 tuner. Not to mention the gadgets being relatively free fodder to discard with the Gearframe, to summon itself outright would give gadgets a much needed beater to help clear boards and one that would punish the opponent for trying to get rid of it to boot. These coupled with something like solidarity meant the deck could go full unga bunga to win its duels. Giving your monsters 800 attack if your grave is only one type means that even yellow gadget becomes a 2000 beater normal summon. And if you can summon four more in the same turn, you're looking at way more than enough to put game on board. The final evolution of the deck would come with the release of Xyz monsters, when gadgets could really shine. Players no longer had to rely on the Machina engine for strength, and instead could couple it with rank 4 spam, adding in cards like Tin Goldfish, the level 4 machine that on normal summon can summon a gadget, and would allow it to search without missing the timing, which was a fresh change of pace coming from cards like Goblinburg, which to explain, the gadgets search when they are summoned, which means that the summon has to be the last thing to occur and resolve. In the case of Goblinburg, it will summon a monster from the hand and then change itself to defense position. And since the last thing to happen is the battle position change, 
the gadgets will miss timing if they're summoned off Goblinburg. The more you know. So the goldfish gave a deck a way to get the ball really rolling by itself, giving it easy access to Gear Gigant X, a rank 4 that could add another machine from deck to hand, like a copy of Gear Frame to add Fortress, or another goldfish to keep the gadget spam going. With this, gadgets became an incredibly consistent deck at getting access to rank 4 plays turn after turn, and if they thinned the deck enough, or just hard opened ultimate offering, the endless rank 4 spam could easily break a board if not build a strong one to deal with through things like Abyss Dweller and the then-legal Shockmaster. But Gadgets weren't the only one playing Ultimate Offering to make rank 4 spam, because I already mentioned Medulce. Medulce is another deck that can easily gain advantage through Endless Normal Summon, namely because they're in theme Stratos. Magellene is not only lacking a hard once per turn clause, but it can search a copy of itself. This coupled with cards like Hootcake, which can help to summon from the deck, meant that the deck would not struggle to get out monsters for an abundance of rank 3 and 4 spam most notably with their boss monster, Tiaramisu, a non-targeted shuffle up to two cards back into the deck, which is an insane effect even today in 2023 as I'm making this, let alone a decade ago. And if they could get out two of this card by abusing the endless normal summons, that shit's just a war crime. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Mind you, that is coming from someone who just wanted to play Noble Knights in 2013 and is heavily biased. And last up was, of course, the fishy deck I mentioned. That's right, Mermail Atlantean, or Merlantian as I knew it back in the day, would play the card from time to time, most often as a card to side in to hope that you skill drew it when going first. The deck had no shortage of solid normal summons, from Deep Sea Diva for tuner access and more free bodies, and Gen X Undyne to trigger your Atlantean monster effects, most notably Dragoons to search for more powerful monsters in your hand like Mermail Abyss Megalo. This allowed the deck to make a very solid board if it went first, able to end on then meta threats like Wind Up Zen Mains or Abyss Dweller. It wasn't the most popular card in the deck, but it was unlimited normal summons, which in practical terms was just very abusable. So much so that despite the card's limited usage in the grand scheme, it got banned and has been for over a decade as I'm making this video. The ability to normal summon over and over and over is just so strong that even in this video, I'm ignoring the 500 life points paid per summon because they don't matter relative to the endless normal summons. Some of these decks that I've mentioned at one point or another even considered teching in copies of Monarchs like Caius or Ryza, just because this card lets you summon on the opponent's battle phase as well, meaning that you could play the Monarchs as a form of disruption. Just don't tell Simo. The card definitely could have been a nuisance in the hat format and the early Duelist Alliance era. I mean, can you imagine if Cleefort got endless normal summons on its own turn? That is terrifying to think about. And yet, as time has gone on, it seems this card has reached the point where it's gone from being too good to being too slow. I won't tell you the exact date, but it was January 15th, 2016. At some point, the speed of the game exploded, and waiting until the third turn to be able to make meaningful plays was not worth waiting for. Sure, your gadgets will become a million rank fours on turn three, but you're going to die on turn two if you aren't making a strong enough board to resist the opponent. If you're playing ultimate offering going first in practical terms, means that you're only playing with four cards in your opening hand. There's definitely an argument that the card can come back without impacting the metagame beyond that one gadget player at your locals. It's hard to say if it'll come off the list anytime soon though, as at the time of my making this video, the OCG has already gotten Terminal Offering, a retrain of sorts that lets you pay a thousand life points to get three normal summons for the turn. It's a much weaker version of Ultimate Offering and it's seen very little play in the OCG from what I've been able to find for much of the same reasons that people argue Ultimate Offering is just a non-issue. For my take on the card, I'm fine with it stand banned. At top level events right now, this card will not make a difference. And while I'm not really worried about gadget players or Medulce's breaking this card unbelievably, I'm more worried about the inevitable card that will let someone cheat this out on turn one. There's a Labyrinth card that can let you set and use Dimensional Barrier on the opponent's turn when they're going first, and while that's not the most consistent thing, it's definitely a thing. And a version of that that would give endless normal summons, including on the opponent's turn, is something I'm fine having a lid on. Flu on to Reese is enough to have to deal with, and I don't need more of that. Also, speaking of flu, no, they wouldn't care for this. The whole deck already normal summons 28 times per turn on both players' turns. They don't need this when they can just put in slots of actual good cards like Dimension Shifter. Overall, Ultimate Offering is a goofy card. 
in terms of both the card art and the effect. TCG gets the Fat Man, where the OCG gets a blood ritual. Explain that. I, for one, prefer the Fat Man. And who could have seen Endless Normal Summons being a ban-worthy effect? In slower formats, where cards can plus on summon like the gadgets, it can become an insane advantage for the player who controls it, and yet as the game is sped up, it's almost certainly met the same fate that many other trap cards have before it, becoming too slow to really matter. These days, it's a card with two takes depending on when it is you started playing. It's either, oh yeah, gadgets were crazy with that, or it's, why is this even banned? Truly, the duality of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And so that's our look at Yu-Gi-Oh single card history, ultimate offering. Stay tuned for our next video, and feel free to suggest some cards to review or what type of video you'd like to see. Don't forget to like, and as always, subscribe to YGO Strats to impress your smoking Italian wife, and so you too can be a true duelist.